So the current economics of transportation are actually highly challenging. Um, vehicles are very inefficient. We pay about $12,000 a year. Most of that we're really spending on owning the car so that we can park it. Uh, we really only utilize the car 2.5% of the time. And we pay a lot of money in fuel and insurance that really isn't necessary. That's all because our system is inefficient. We have a lot of crashes that are caused by human error. We pay a lot for fuel that really actually burns up into heat that doesn't really move us from A to B. And we spend a lot of on money on roads that really only get utilized at the peak usage occasionally, once a day. Um, if we look forward though, there's some really innovative models. Uh, the sharing model dramatically improves the utilization of the vehicles because instead of a vehicle being used 2% of the time, it could be used as much as 50% of the time. So that's more than a tenfold increase, 20-fold increase in that case. Uh, and that makes the cost per mile actually dramatically cheaper. In fact, if you look at the equivalent cost of owning a car versus taking Uber or Lyft or another car ride-sharing service, if you're driving less than 5,000 miles per year today, um, it's actually much cheaper for you to just take a car sharing or ride sharing service every time you want to go somewhere than it is for you to own the car. If you drive a lot, you're a salesman or you travel a lot in your car, then it still makes sense for you to own that car because the ultimate cost per mile would be lower that way. But most people actually drive 10,000 miles or less, so there's a good chunk of the population for whom it's already become cheaper. And if you look forward, if we either make autonomous cars and then we reduce the cost of the driver today in, in an Uber or in a Lyft, um, or we make the cost of the car cheaper um, through a combination of electrifying it, uh, being able to shrink the size of the car to only what you really need typically. We, we, right now we drive around four seats even though typically we only use one or two. Uh, all of those reductions will further reduce the cost. That means your, your break-even point for actually using a car only when you need it will, will cross that 10,000 miles that covers most of the population. The effects are very, very broad because we're talking about going from 70 to a dollar, 70 cents to a dollar 20 today to less than 10 cents. Um, so that means that anybody that's in the transport space today, whether you're shipping people or goods, uh, delivering, whether it's you know flowers, packages, anybody who's relying on transportation at all, their costs will dramatically shrink. The same thing for a lot of the services, because services today require either somebody to come to us or us to go somewhere, whether that's going to the bank, going to a doctor, going to school, all of that will change. It can change even more dramatically, by the way, if we go make it virtual and go online and don't have to go anywhere anymore at all. But even for those who still have to physically go somewhere, that it changes. It gives a whole segment of the population access to mobility that they've never had. So anybody who's too young to have a driver's license, anybody who's too old to frail or handicapped or blind that can't actually drive themselves, in this world of autonomous shared vehicles, they can go anywhere on their own. So there's a big segment of the population that actually becomes more productive and is able to participate in, in the rest of the economy. It also has a bunch of knock-on effects. The automotive industry itself is a big industry today. Insurance is a big industry today, $200 billion just for the U.S. alone. So those industries will change. Uh, there's an opportunity for them to reinvent themselves, to take advantage of the shift and actually make more money. But the size of those industries is going to change. We'll, we'll have fewer cars in production if we utilize them more and utilize them more efficiently. Uh, they may actually be higher margin because you can add more quality into a car if you're really using it a lot more. Uh, so that's an opportunity, but there's also a, a risk for those industries. And then that industry feeds into so many others in terms of parts, in terms of metals and materials. Big changes coming for the oil industry. If we share cars, it's actually much easier to go electric uh, because you can share cars for the range that you need. You don't have to worry about range anxiety because I can always swap into a longer range or bigger vehicle when I need it. That means for the oil industry, there's a dramatic reduction in, in oil demand from transportation. Um, we forget that the original oil demand actually was for lighting. Um, that was quickly replaced after one or two decades by transport use. Now transport use swamps everything. I'm sure the oil industry will find new uses for specialty chemicals, for new materials, but that transport use is already shrinking. We've, we've hit peak oil demand in the U.S., for example, um, even though we still have increase in, in supply, um, just because cars are more efficient and are burning less fuel per mile today already. So the effects are, are really wide-ranging and broad, and what I expect to happen over two or three decades is to see an upshift in, in GDP and in the growth of each country overall from the benefit of, of more accessible and, and 
more affordable transportation broadly. Yeah, and actually maybe first one other big effect that I didn't talk about in terms of the economic impact is, is real estate. Now, today's land use patterns are very much oriented around the car. The whole notion of a suburb, subdivision, the amount of land we have for parking spaces in cities, whether it's street parking or parking garages, and even the value of land, if you go from a city core where land is expensive out into the suburbs where land gets cheaper, all of that will shift when we have shared autonomous cars because it's much easier to drive further out. We don't have to have parking spaces in the city, so all that is up, up for grabs. Now, how, how do we get there? Uh, there is a number of technical, there still is a number of technical challenges need to get resolved. Uh, we're doing kind of assistive autonomy today. Cars aren't really fully driving themselves in every kind of circumstance. So those are technical challenges about vision, sensor fusion, reliability, understanding all the corner cases so that cars are really learning about the odd cases that they're going to encounter. But we also have big challenges in terms of the, the legal infrastructure. Right now our system basically always holds the driver responsible never the car, never the system, generally not the OEM unless it's a recall or a defect. Uh, we have to figure out who's at fault, who's liable, if, if it's really a network operator running a system of cars. Our insurance system is also tied to the driver, um, and ultimately really we want insurance for a fleet of vehicles, and it becomes just a part of what you pay for, like fuel and tax charges when you, you know, are, are using a rental car. Um, and so all of that will have to shift. There are challenges also in consumer adoption. Um, you know, about 30% of people today, if you survey them, say, I don't trust autonomous cars. Uh, the reality is when they really get into one, after 15, 20 minutes, they actually love it because it's such an amazing experience. And you know, many of us got used to flying in planes that are flown by autopilot, right? We don't worry about, oh, you know, it's actually computer flying. Um, you kind of forget about that once you've flown once or twice. So I think the consumer shift will actually happen quite quickly, but the regulatory shift, the, the redesign of cities, the redesign of the insurance and liability model, that will actually take some time and will not happen evenly. Different pockets in the world will, will adopt faster than others.